It's really wonderful to be here at the University of Chicago with you this evening for what is the last stop on my Illinois book tour. And I can think of no more appropriate venue than the University of Chicago to talk about the policies of President Obama toward Israel and the Palestinian people during his first term. And I'll also talk a bit about what's been going on in this second term as well, because of course, as many of you are aware, President Obama was a former faculty member here at the University of Chicago, where he taught constitutional law. And of course, the Obama family lives uh, right down the street. And it's of course here in Hyde Park where Obama really first cut his teeth politically, so to speak, getting elected to the Illinois State Senate, representing the constituency of Hyde Park. And as I document in the book, this experience of being a state senator representing Hyde Park in the US, uh, the Illinois State Legislature, really, I think, opened up President Obama's eyes to the Palestinian people and their narrative and their history of suffering and dispossession and dislocation living under Israeli rule to an extent that no other president had when entering office. And I think it's very true that President Obama had a number of factors going for him when he entered the White House in 2009 that could have led to a real fundamental and true transformation of our policies toward Israel and the Palestinian people, which as I progress through this talk, uh, I think you'll see that I believe to be very wrong and much in need uh, of that change. But some of the questions I'm getting as I go around the country about the title of my book, Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to Broker uh, Israeli-Palestinian Peace are really twofold. Number one, why am I picking on President Obama? And number two, aren't I being a bit presumptuous and perhaps premature to call this policy of his of brokering Israeli-Palestinian peace a failure, given that he, of course, still has more than two years in office? So let me address some of these issues at the outset. As I make clear in the book, the policies that the Obama administration pursued in its first term were really a continuation of existing U.S. policies toward this issue. So this is not so much uh, picking out or singling out or making an exceptional case of President Obama and his approach toward this issue, but situating his policies within a broader context of a failed U.S. policy toward Israel and the Palestinian people. Now, it's true that every single president since Harry S. Truman recognized the existence of Israel in 1948 has tried their hand in one way or another to broker Israeli-Palestinian peace. And it's been both Democrats and Republicans who have tried and all have failed. And what I would argue is the main reason for this failure is because the United States has never approached the Israeli-Palestinian issue as we claim to approach it, which is as an honest broker. This is what we hear incessantly out of Washington, D.C., that the United States is a disinterested observer and is playing an even-handed, honest role in helping to broker an accord between the two sides. Uh, I believe that nothing could be further from the truth. I actually believe that we, as the United States, function in effect as Israel's lawyers in these negotiations. Now, this term, Israel's lawyers, is not one that I made up. It's one that was coined by a fellow by the name of Aaron David Miller, who was a senior U.S. peace process negotiator during the Clinton era and during parts of the George W. Bush administration. And what he admitted after he left government service in an op-ed in the Washington Post entitled Israel's Lawyers was that we have catered to every Israeli whim at the expense of having successful negotiations. And he said that if the United States is to play a role in helping to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian issue, then we can have one client and one client only. And that client is not Israel. That client is the requirements of a just and lasting peace. 
So what I do in this book is I look to see whether President Obama in his first term in office was able to break free from this tradition of acting in this very biased and unbalanced manner as Israel's lawyer, or whether he perpetuated these policies. And the answer I come up with in my book is that it was a mixed bag. It was a mixed bag. And so I give credit where credit is due to President Obama. And I do think that there are a number of uh, instances and occasions for which he does deserve credit. But because the president made this such a high profile priority by appointing a special envoy for Middle East peace in just the second day in office, and because he said to the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, that it was his personal commitment to move expeditiously to establish a Palestinian state in his first term. Because this was such a high priority for him, I also place the blame at his feet where I feel blame is due. Because this is not about excoriating politicians, but this is about fixing a broken policy. Now, I believe that President Obama deserves credit because, as I mentioned, being a state senator representing this district here, right here in Hyde Park afforded, this, afforded him a very unique insight and opportunity to understand the Palestinian narrative because, of course, he had a large constituency of Palestinian American voters and it was a normal thing for him to attend community functions, to go to the homes of former professors from the University of Chicago, like Professor Rashid Khalidi, and learn from him about the Palestinian experience. And it wasn't just that he had this knowledge and understanding of the Palestinian people that no other president had when entering office, but he also had a level of empathy that no one else had, including Jimmy Carter for that, for that matter. And I say this because when he went to Cairo in June of 2009 and delivered what I think was his best foreign policy speech of his term, the new beginning with the Muslim world, he said that it is undeniable that Palestinians, Muslims and Christians alike have suffered in pursuit of a homeland. He talked about the fact that Palestinian refugees languish today in refugee camps, denied their right to live in peace and security. And he talked about the daily indignities and humiliations that Palestinians face living under Israeli military occupation. No president, no president had ever said anything close to this before. This empathy that he showed for the Palestinians was truly pathbreaking. Now this of course did not mean that he did not have empathy for Israel and for Israeli Jews. And in fact, in the book I quote often about how his policies uh, and pronouncements were very much in line with the standard pro-Israel line as well. So he had this empathy for the Palestinians that no other president had. And he also broke with this terrible U.S. tradition of appointing a clear pro-Israel ideologue as the so-called broker for Israeli-Palestinian peace. This was the MO that occurred again and again and again during the Clinton years, during the George W. Bush years. So whether we're talking about Aaron David Miller, who I mentioned before, or Dennis Ross, or um, Elliot Abrams, uh, these were all people who were clear pro-Israel ideologues and who worked for pro-Israel organizations before working for the government, and often returned to those very same jobs after they were done working for this so-called peace process. Now, Obama was different on this score because the person who he appointed to be a special envoy didn't have this ideological baggage. The person he appointed was the former Senate Majority Leader, George Mitchell, a person who brought serious gravitas and an understanding of conflict resolution to this game that nobody else had brought before. This was the very same person who brokered an end to eight centuries of conflict between Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland through the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. He knew what he was doing, and he knew how to take a very difficult, sectarian, religious, historical conflict and to transform it into a positive outcome. Now, we know from the Palestine Papers, which were leaked to Al Jazeera back in 2011 from within the Palestinian negotiating team, we know that the Palestinian negotiating team was ecstatic 
They were ecstatic over Mitchell's appointment. And what they said was that we might actually get the fair shake out of the Obama administration that we've never had from Washington before. Now, on the other hand, the Israel lobby was incredibly upset and worried about Mitchell's appointment. Why? Because they understood that he could have been an honest broker. And this is not what the Israel lobby wants. The Israel lobby wants us to maintain our policies of acting as Israel's lawyers in these talks, which has been so disastrous for the course of peace and justice. Now, the third thing that Obama had going for him was that unlike Clinton, unlike Bush, who with a wink and a nod allowed Israel to continue its ongoing rapid colonization of Palestinian lands all throughout the so-called peace process, President Obama at the start of his term put his foot down and said that Israel had to stop colonizing Palestinian land completely and permanently in order for there to be a credible negotiating process. Now contrast this with the Clinton years and the Bush years where you had a nearly three-fold increase in the amount of Israeli settlers living on colonized Palestinian lands in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, and until 2005 in the Gaza Strip as well. But Obama put his foot down and said, no, this colonization has to stop. Israel has to fulfill its prior obligations and comply with international law and stop illegally colonizing this Palestinian land. So what happens if President Obama had all of these things at the outset of his administration going for him that actually could have resulted in a change in policy away from being Israel's lawyer and toward being an actual honest broker? Well, here's where reality sets in. And this gets to the structural uh, problematic nature of US policy toward Israel and the Palestinians because like other presidents, he continued many of these patterns and practices that prevent the United States from acting in a fair and just way. So for example, number one, like every US president since Richard Nixon, President Obama increased the amount of weapons that we as taxpayers give to Israel to oppress the Palestinian people and to perpetuate this military occupation that we claim to oppose. This is something that makes no sense under international law. Under international law, when you provide a party to a conflict with weapons, you have violated the laws of neutrality and you have declared yourself to be on the side of the party that you are arming. This is the reality of international law. We have declared ourselves to be on Israel's side by providing them with these weapons. And to give you a sense of the extent to which we arm Israel, we underwrite 20% of Israel's entire military budget. Israel spends $15 billion a year on its military. We pay for $3 billion of it. And this is a tremendous advantage for Israel because this makes it a much less difficult guns versus butter debate within Israeli society. If it weren't for this $3 billion subsidy that we provided to Israel every year, Israel would face much starker budgetary choices for its oppression of the Palestinian people. Now, to give you another sense of the extent to which we're arming Israel, in the last decade, the decades of the 2000s, our research found that we as US taxpayers gave Israel more than 650 million weapons and pieces of ammunition. We provided just in three years to the Israeli military enough bullets to kill every single Palestinian living under Israeli military occupation 10 times over, just in three years. This is the extent to which we are arming Israel, and this is the extent to which we as US taxpayers and citizens are complicit in Israel's atrocities against the Palestinian people. Just two days ago, a woman near Bethlehem was killed after inhaling copious amounts of tear gas, which Israel often uses to break up nonviolent Palestinian protests. Now, it's often the case that the tear gas that the Israeli military uses is from a company called CSI, Combined Systems Inc., in Jamestown, Pennsylvania. And these are tear gas canisters that are provided to Israel by us as US taxpayers. Now, I don't know if that was the case with this particular incident, but there have been many, many cases 
where U.S. made and paid for tear gas canisters have injured and killed innocent Palestinians engaging in their right to freedom of expression and nonviolent demonstration. This is our culpability. And the fact that Obama raised the amount of military aid to Israel during his first term made us that much more complicit. Now, to make matters worse, when he went to Jerusalem in the spring of last year, he vowed to make it a cornerstone of his policy in his second term to conclude a new deal with Israel to give Israel more weapons even beyond when he leaves the White House. So George W. Bush cut a deal to give Israel $30 billion of weapons from 2009 to 2018. The Obama administration leaked it to the press that he wants to cut a deal to give Israel $40 billion in additional weapons all the way until 2028. Now, it's because our provision of weapons to Israel makes the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian issue impossible. This, sadly, will be President Obama's legacy on the issue. This massive increase in military aid to Israel, and it won't be peace. Now, another reason why this policy hasn't worked under Obama is because, like other presidents, as documented by Professor Mearsheimer here at the University of Chicago in his excellent book, The Israel Lobby, when faced with pressure from the Israel Lobby, some presidents have stood up to it and others have capitulated to it. And unfortunately, President Obama chose the latter path. And this capitulation to the demands of the Israel Lobby actually occurred very early on in his term. It happened in June 2009 in a closed door meeting the result of which was Obama's commitment to place at the National Security Council a fellow by the name of Dennis Ross to be his, quote, quarterback on all Middle East issues. So who is this person, Dennis Ross? He was the key U.S. peace process figure during the George H.W. Bush years and during the Clinton years. And he wrote a memoir called The Missing Peace. And he wrote about his job in The Missing Peace as being that of a seller. He talked about his job being to sell Israeli ideas to the Palestinians and to get the Palestinians to scale back their expectations. This is how much of a dishonest broker Dennis Ross admitted to being. And this is the person who Obama appointed at the National Security Council to undercut George Mitchell and to prevent George Mitchell from being the honest broker that he needed to be. Now, let me give you one more reason why I think this policy in the first term failed, and then I'll talk a bit more about what the current efforts are to broker Israeli-Palestinian peace and why those two have faltered. Uh, like other presidents, Obama increased the amount of diplomatic protection that we provide to Israel at the UN, and we see this very, very clearly through WikiLeaks. We see it documented how the United States and Israel colluded to prevent Israel from being held accountable for the war crimes that were documented by the Goldstone Report, which was a report by the UN Human Rights Council issued after Israel's barbaric attack on Gaza in December of 08 and January of 09, an attack which killed more than 1,400 Palestinians in the course of three weeks, the vast majority of whom were civilians. Now, the Goldstone Report found in 575 pages of truly heartbreaking detail that Israel had committed war crimes against the civilian population of Gaza during this attack. And this report called for Israel to be held accountable for these war crimes. Now, when this report came out in September of 2009, this was at the exact same time that President Obama was winning his Nobel Peace Prize. And instead of saying, in the spirit of this Nobel Peace Prize, I believe that anyone who commits grave human rights violations and certainly anyone who commits war crimes should be held accountable. Instead, what we see, both publicly and privately through WikiLeaks, is that the United States blocked accountability from taking place through the Security Council. And in fact, Obama's uh, ambassador to the UN Susan Rice at the time, is actually gloating in one of these cables to her Israeli counterpart about the tremendous 
coordination there's been between the two countries to, quote, blunt the effects of the Goldstone Report and prevent Israel from being held accountable. And this diplomatic protection of Israel at the UN and in other international forums we see occur again and again and again during Obama's term in office, and we see it continuing into his second term. So whether we're talking about vetoing a resolution condemning Israeli settlement expansion, or we're talking about Palestine being admitted to the UN as a member group, every single instance the United States has worked to ensure that Israel is protected in the UN. I just saw a transcript today of uh, testimony from Samantha Power, who is President Obama's ambassador to the UN in the second term. And she actually admitted in front of Congress that the United States and Israel convene a monthly forum to combat what she called Israel's, quote, delegitimization in international forums, but this is a forum for the two countries to coordinate to make sure that Israel is never held accountable to its violations of Security Council resolutions, its violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention, and its war crimes. So unfortunately, I don't think that the title of my book is premature. I wish it were otherwise. I wish that President Obama were successful in brokering a just and lasting peace. But here's why, despite all the problematic nature of the policy in his first term, the policy is even worse off today in his second term in 2014 than it was in 2009 and stands less of a chance of succeeding. In fact, I would say virtually no chance of succeeding. And the reason why I believe that to be the case is because unlike in his first term, in his second term, we've gone back to this tradition of appointing clear pro-Israel ideologues to be our quote, peace process brokers. So this time around, it's not a fellow like George Mitchell who truly had no dog in this fight, but the person who's the head of this so-called peace process team is a guy by the name of Martin Indyk, who before he worked for the US government was a senior employee of the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, the largest, most influential, and strongest group within the Israel lobby. And if you look at the composition of this so-called peace process team, most of its members come from this type of pro-Israel ideological background. The second reason why this policy is even worse off today is because in Obama's first term, at least we had the pretense that we cared about stopping Israel's illegal colonization of Palestinian lands. That's not the case. In fact, today, it looks more like outright collusion between the United States and Israel to perpetuate and even increase the pace of this colonization. Since these talks resumed in July of last year, Israel has announced the expansion of more than 10,000 settlement units on Palestinian land. So a reporter asked John Kerry, the Secretary of State, a very obvious question at the outset of these talks after Israel had announced for the umpteenth time that it was expanding settlements. And the reporter said, do you expect that Israel will continue to announce these settlement expansions while these talks are going on, while the parties are theoretically sitting down and talking about the establishment of a Palestinian state on the territory that Israel was colonizing? And John Kerry said something to the effect of, yes, we understand that there are many Israeli settlement projects that are currently in the pipeline, and that these announcements will be ongoing throughout the duration of these negotiations. But, but he said, we don't want Israel's announcement of settlement expansion to be an obstacle to the success of these negotiations. How can they not be? What is there left for there to be established a Palestinian state on? It's all colonized. It's all cut up into tiny little fragments and pieces already. Back almost a decade ago, George W. Bush, certainly no friend of the Palestinians, referred to the West Bank as Swiss cheese because that's what Israel's colonization has done. And what was the case 10 years ago is even more so today because as I mentioned, Israel's settlement population has nearly tripled in the past 20 years. Now, to understand what Kerry's current efforts are all about and how he got to this 
point where we are in 2014, I think it's necessary to approach this from a bit of a historical context to give it some background because the proposals really don't make sense if you don't have a basic outline of the history at play here. And to really, I think, understand this issue, and you may have noticed that I'm intentionally not using the word conflict to describe the situation between Israel and the Palestinians because when we say conflict, it tends to conjure up in our minds an image of two uh, equal opposing forces, each with armies and states and equality between them fighting a standard battle. This is not at all the case, not at all the case between Israel uh, and the Palestinians. Uh, but to understand this issue, you really need to turn the clock all the way back to the First World War, because prior to the First World War, the Ottoman Empire controlled what is today's modern Middle East. And in the aftermath of its defeat in World War I, the victorious European powers divided up these former Ottoman provinces into what were called mandates. The idea behind these mandates was to prepare the indigenous inhabitants of these lands for independence, for self-determination. So France got the mandate for Syria and Lebanon. Britain got the mandate for Iraq, Transjordan, later the Kingdom of Jordan, and Palestine. But the case of the mandate for Palestine was always different. It was always treated differently from all of the other mandates because the express declared policy of Britain was not to prepare the indigenous Palestinian inhabitants of the land for independence and self-determination. But even before Britain got this mandate, the expressed policy of the British Empire was to work with the Zionist movement to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And indeed, for the roughly three decades that Britain held this mandate over Palestine, the two worked very closely to establish the institutions and agencies that would become necessary for establishing this Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, at the time when Britain washed its hands of this issue in 1947 and turned it over to the UN, Jews owned 7% of historic Palestine. Palestinians resided on 93% of the land. And the demographic balance between the two communities was roughly two-thirds Palestinians and one-third Jewish. Against the wishes of the majority of the inhabitants of Palestine who were never even consulted, under heavy diplomatic pressure from the United States, the UN voted to partition Palestine into two states, a Jewish state on 55% of the land, an Arab state on 45% of this land. Now, nobody was really happy about this partition plan, least of all the Palestinian people who couldn't for the life of them understand how it was the right of an international body to come in and divide their homeland against their will. And fighting broke out between Zionist forced forces and indigenous uh, Palestinian forces. And this later became an interstate war in 1948, which ended with armistice agreements in 1949, which resulted in Israel establishing sovereignty over 78% of historic Palestine. And in the process of establishing this sovereignty over more than three quarters of the land, Israel engaged in a very systematic, very deliberate, campaign of ethnic cleansing, to drive out as many Palestinians from their homes from as much of historic Palestine as possible. We often hear this talking point from Israel and its supporters that the goal of the Palestinians is to drive Israeli Jews into the sea. Well, if you look at pictures from what actually happened in 1948, in places like Jaffa on the Mediterranean Sea, Palestinians were literally driven into the sea and driven into boats and forced to flee for their lives to Lebanon and to Gaza. Israel demolished between four and 500 Palestinian villages during this war, what Palestinians refer to as the Nakba, or catastrophe, because during this war, Israel tried to erase Palestinians' presence from this land. This is the reality of who has thrown whom off of this land and who has tried to erase whose presence from this land, not the other way around. And in fact, 90% of indigenous Palestinians 
who lived in what became Israel were driven out, often forcibly, during this war and not allowed to return. Now, they and their descendants number some five million people today and live in refugee camps, unable to exercise their internationally guaranteed right of return to their homes and their properties because Israel views these Palestinian refugees not as people, not as human beings with human rights, but as a, quote, demographic threat. And Israel asserts for itself a right nowhere to be found in international law, which is a right to ethnic cleansing and a right to continue profiting from these acts of ethnic cleansing. There is no right of a state to artificially maintain a demographic majority of a certain group through an act of ethnic cleansing. This right does not exist in international law. Palestinians have a right of return. This is an individual human right that's guaranteed to every single human being by Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says that anyone can leave their home at any time and for any reason and come back at any time and for any reason. But if you're a Jewish person from Chicago, like me, you can pack up your bags, move to Israel tomorrow, and enjoy citizenship. Here you have a clear case of discrimination between Palestinians and Israeli Jews based on factors none other than their nationality and religion. Now for those Palestinians who were not driven out of their homes in 1948, who stayed and became citizens of the state of Israel today, they number 1.5 million and are 20% of Israel's population. It's a little known fact that Israel has always been a binational state even after the original act of ethnic cleansing in 1948. And it's also a talking point that Israel uses that we are a democracy because Palestinian citizens of Israel, who are always referred to as Arabs, never Palestinians, never having a nationality, are citizens, that they can vote, that they can run for office in Israel. And all of this is true, absolutely. But African Americans had a right to vote in the Jim Crow South, but that certainly didn't make them full and equal citizens of the United States, not by a long shot. And in fact, today, these Palestinian citizens of Israel face systemic discrimination against them. There are 54 laws on the website of Adela, which is a Palestinian legal support group within Israel, documenting how Israel discriminates against Palestinian citizens of Israel and privileges its Jewish citizens, like through land use, for example. Land use is controlled not by the state of Israel for the benefit of its citizens, but instead it's subcontracted out to the Jewish National Fund. Israel is the only country in the world that doesn't control its own use of public lands. Everywhere else it's a government function. But Israel has contracted it out to a private charitable organization, which says in its charter that the land of Israel is not for the benefit of its citizens, but for the benefit of the Jewish people. So if you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel, you are not enabled to rent public land because the JNF considers you to be the wrong religion and the wrong nationality. Currently, Israel is trying to ethnically cleanse between 40 and 70,000 of its own citizens, Palestinians in the south, in the Negev or Naqab desert, who Israel wants to remove from their ancestral lands to build Jewish Israeli settlements on. The process of dispossession and driving Palestinians out looks today very similar within Israel as it does in the West Bank. It's all part of one grand governmental philosophy that privileges one set of people and discriminates against another. Now this was a situation that obtained until 1967 when Israel conquered the remaining 22% of historic Palestine and placed these territories under military occupation, what we today call West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. And if you are one of the 4.5 million Palestinians under this Israeli military occupation, you do not have any recognized political rights whatsoever. In fact, the very first military order that Israel passed when it occupied these territories made it, quote, illegal for Palestinians to wave a flag. 
It made it illegal for Palestinians to write an article in the Palestinian media that's critical of Israel. It made it illegal for Palestinians to join political parties. It made it illegal for Palestinians to gather in groups of 10 or more people for any political purpose whatsoever. These draconian restrictions and the fact that just over the last 15 years, Israel has killed thousands of Palestinian civilians under military occupation and injured tens of thousands, none of this regime of draconian human rights abuses applies to those Jewish Israelis who have come to colonize expropriated Palestinian land. The opposite is true. The Israeli government gives them perks and benefits to do so. And the discrimination between the two is so blatant that Israel has actually built infrastructure on Palestinian land in the West Bank that Palestinians cannot use. So there are two different colored license plates. One if you're an Israeli Jewish settler, a different one if you are Palestinian. And there are roads if you have the Palestinian license plate that you simply cannot drive on. So think of if Indiana and Illinois were both sovereign countries and Indiana came in and conquered Illinois and took away the land and expropriated for the use of its own residents and then built infrastructure on that land that people in Illinois couldn't even use. This is the reality that Palestinians today face. And the problem with this so-called peace process, and if you take just one thing away from this talk tonight, this is what I hope it would be. The problem is that it has not been about ending these separate and unequal Israeli policies toward the Palestinian people, but the actual reverse, again, is true. This so-called peace process is about deepening and entrenching and trying to make permanent Israel's separate and unequal control over the Palestinian people. Now, the international community has a word for these type of discriminatory policies that privilege one set of people and discriminate against another set of people based on factors such as race, religion, ethnicity, nationality, etc. And that word is apartheid. And yes, that's of course a word that comes to us via South Africa, but it has an international legal meaning. And in fact, it's a crime against humanity as defined by the international community. And the problem with this peace process is it's not about ending Israeli apartheid toward the Palestinians, but strengthening it. And with this background, you can understand a little bit more about what John Kerry's proposals are all about and why they failed just like every previous US effort has failed, because it's not about a just peace, but it's about ensuring Israel's continued domination and control and apartheid over the Palestinian people. So what are these negotiations all about, which are on the verge of collapse as we speak? And why, if Israel and the United States and the Palestinian negotiating team all say that they want the exact same outcome from these talks, why is it so difficult for the sides to get there? All of them say they want a two-state resolution to this issue, meaning the establishment of a Palestinian state in part or all of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip. So what's so hard about getting to this end game? Well, the reason I would argue is because that when the United States and Israel say that they want a Palestinian state, this means one thing over here. But when the Palestinian negotiating team says that they want a state, it means something else completely over here. And there's absolutely no overlap between these two visions. So when the Palestinian negotiating team says that it wants a state, what it means is that it wants a state with all the sovereignties and privileges and prerogatives that all of the other 193 nations of the world enjoy. So think about what we as a country can do. We can control our borders, and we do control our borders, ever more militarized. We control our water, territorial water. We control our territorial airspace. We control our natural resources. We have an army. We have an independent foreign policy. We enter into treaties with other countries as we deem fit. This is the standard understanding of what it means to be a sovereign entity in the post-World War II international political system. But 
None of these things, not one of them, will apply to the so-called Palestinian state that the United States and Israel are trying to push on the Palestinian people. So what does the United States and Israel mean when they talk about Palestinian statehood? They mean Israel annexing all of its major settlement blocks on Palestinian land, dividing the West Bank up into tiny, disconnected little fragments of land. They mean that Palestinians won't have any access to or sovereignty over what we think of when we think of Jerusalem. Instead, the so-called capital of Jerusalem will be behind Israel's apartheid wall, cut off from the heart of Jerusalem. And the apartheid wall that Israel has built in the West Bank will stay exactly where it is. It won't come down. It'll stay where it is, along with all of Israel's military infrastructure that it's built on Palestinian land. The military bases, the bypass roads that only Israeli settlers can use, Israeli military presence in the Jordan Valley, cutting off the West Bank from its neighbor, Jordan. The plan for so-called statehood that the United States and Israel envision is not at all a sovereign entity. It's not at all a sovereign entity. This Palestinian so-called state won't control its borders, won't control its water off of the Mediterranean Sea, won't control its airspace. They won't even be allowed to control their electromagnetic field, which I confess I have no idea what that actually meant. But the Israeli prime minister started talking about it incessantly. So I figured this must be something really important to Israel if Israel insists that it controls the Palestinian electromagnetic field. So it turns out that it's related. I'm, I'm very non-scientific, by the way. Uh, it turns out that it's related to things like cell phone signals and radio transmissions. Palestinians won't even have control over their cell phone network under this so-called state. They won't have control over their economy. They won't be able to import and export as they see fit. They won't be able to have an independent foreign policy, no army, no ability to enter into treaties. This is not a state. What this is is exactly what South Africa attempted to do in the 1970s and the 1980s to get the international community off of its back which was to create, quote, independent homelands for black South Africans. These were known as Bantu stands. And the idea behind these Bantu stands was that black South Africans would be stripped of their right to reside within apartheid South African society and herded onto these tiny little disconnected fragments of land, which were nominally under black South African control, but had no sovereignty, no power, no ability to control their economy, not even any real autonomy in any real way. Do you know how many countries recognize these so-called independent homelands as actual sovereign states? It was just one, just one country recognized these Bantu stands as states, and that was the apartheid regime of South Africa. Nobody else believed South Africa when they said that it was no longer exercising apartheid that black South Africans were now exercising their self-determination through these Bantu stands. Nobody was fooled. But what was wrong in the eyes of the United States and even Israel, which was closely collaborating with the apartheid regime in South Africa at the time, what was wrong for black South Africans is exactly what the United States and Israel are trying to impose today on the Palestinian people, which is why this process has failed yet again and why the United States is incapable, incapable of brokering a just and lasting peace. Now, despite this kind of doom and gloom analysis about where things stand at the official governmental level, I don't want to leave you uh, with a pessimistic analysis because actually on the contrary, I'm very optimistic about where things stand today in 2014 because for so long, for so long, the United States has been trying to hammer a square peg into the round hole in terms of trying to broker a peace deal between the two sides. And it's crystal clear to everyone, including Secretary of State John Kerry, including President Obama, that the jig is up. This game is over. It's run its course. When Secretary of State Kerry was nominated last spring, he said that there's a one to one and a half year window for resolving the Israeli-Palestinian issue on the basis of two states. Otherwise, this colonization will render a Palestinian state impossible. 
And President Obama recently warned Israel just about four or five weeks ago that he will be powerless to stop Israel from facing the flood of international recriminations that it is going to face from the breakdown of these talks. We are clearly today in April 2014 at a historical turning point, at a juncture in which old paradigms are collapsing and we're witnessing the birth of new paradigms. And the problem with trying to hit a square peg into the round hole is that it's not an issue of how many times you try to hit it in or how forcefully you try to hit it in. This is not a matter of the United States trying harder. It's an issue of the United States having the wrong pattern to fit the hole. And so this will open up new creative ways of thinking for how to resolve this issue fairly and justly for all. Now, the second reason why I'm extremely optimistic about where things stand is because we have seen over the past few years the tremendous growth of the international movement led by Palestinian civil society for campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel, against corporations that are profiteering from its oppression of the Palestinian people. This movement is very self-consciously modeled on the global movement that isolated and delegitimized and brought an end to apartheid in South Africa. And I want to be very clear about this, and I hope that my remarks are not misunderstood to mean that I endorse any form of violence against Israeli Jews, because I don't. But Israel has to pay a price for its oppression of the Palestinian people. It has to pay a price. Because if it does not pay a price, there is no incentive for it to change its policies. And the reality is that this global movement for BDS is finally imposing a price on Israel for its oppression of the Palestinians. The Israeli finance minister about five or six weeks ago admitted that the BDS movement already is costing Israel $5 billion a year in lost exports. Israelis are starting to pay an economic price, and they're starting to pay a cultural price as well. Growing numbers of performers are refusing to play in Tel Aviv anymore because they don't want to cross the picket line and be seen as endorsing and normalizing Israel's apartheid policies toward the Palestinian people. And when Israeli cultural performers get sent here as ambassadors sponsored by Israel's foreign ministry, they are facing boycotts and protests at every single venue that they play at, every single venue. Israel has already begun this process of becoming isolated and its policies delegitimized and its apartheid policies attacked from every conceivable angle. Now, the thing that makes me optimistic is that it's always the case that social structures, and especially structures of oppression, always seem very formidable, seem very strong, seem very solid, and oftentimes stuck in place. But the reality is that these structures of oppression are being undermined and get undermined, oftentimes behind the scenes, often bit by bit. But the thing with undermining is that changes aren't visible at first. But eventually, enough of the support for Israeli apartheid will be undermined so that the entire structure gets very shaky, very wobbly, and that at some point that nobody foresees, this was exactly what happened in South Africa, at a point that nobody foresees, the whole structure will topple over. And I believe that the only way the only way for Israelis and Palestinians to truly sit down at the negotiating table, table and have a true, just, and lasting peace is for these Israeli apartheid policies to be ended as a precondition. Because only as equal human beings can they sit together at the table and negotiate a true, just, and lasting peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So before I open it up for questions, I want to ask for your help in building this campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. I'm going to pass around, maybe if you could help pass around. I've got flyers about the BDS movement, what it is, its principles, how you can get involved with different campaigns. 
And then I've also got postcards to President Obama, which I'll walk over to his house right afterwards, uh, if any of you want to sign, uh, asking him to end US military aid to Israel and redirect the money to unmet needs right here at home. So if you agree with that sentiment, please sign out a, uh, please sign a card, and you can just drop it off at the table on your way out. Feel free to take some for friends, family, colleagues, et cetera, who you think might agree with the message as well. OK, so here's how I do Q&A. Uh, I'll take a few questions at a time and answer them as a block, and that tends to get more people involved. So, and I try to maintain gender balance and student to community balance, too. OK, so who's first? Let me, let me take three questions. All right, so let's do one and two and three. OK, yeah, please. I wonder if you could comment on the role, if any, that the first uh, Secretary of State that Obama had, Hillary Clinton, yeah. in, the, in this issue that you call it. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. So how do we strengthen it now? Yeah. OK. Yes. Um, this is about uh, optimism and BDS and yeah. everything we can do to weaken the state of Israel. But I was just wondering, all of these movements, how can they work if US has a special relationship with Israel? And let's say it loses $2 billion from here, but the US will, recom will recompensate it, and if not triple, right. and provide it with more money. Right. Uh, good questions. So amongst uh, President Obama's foreign policy team in his first term, uh, Hillary Clinton was the least of the senior foreign policy levels uh, officials, the least uh, emotionally attached to Israel. Uh, Joe Biden, Susan Rice, as I write about in the book, were heartfelt, emotionally committed uh, to Israel and to Zionism. Hillary Clinton has always approached this issue in a much more uh, cold political calculating way. Uh, she, in my estimation, was a better uh, Secretary of State than her successor, uh, John Kerry. And I think of the potential presidential candidates who might win in 2016, I think uh, she might be the most surprising in terms of uh, not allowing Israel to get away with what President Obama has let it get away with. And I want to be very clear. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of racism directed at, at President Obama. And uh, I think if President Obama were white, I think he would have had a much easier time uh, rebuking Israel for its multiple slaps in the face that, that he had received uh, during his term as I document. Uh, what can we do to strengthen the, uh, the pro-Palestine front here in the United States? Uh, educate people. Organize people, be visible, be loud, uh, put the Israel lobby on the defensive. And the best way to do that is through campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Because the reality is that Israel and its supporters cannot defend Israel on the merits of its case anymore. So what we're seeing is the Israel lobby being placed in a really untenable situation because they can say nothing. And when things come to a vote democratically, we usually win. Not always, but usually. So they're, they're in this situation where if they let things go, then they lose on the merits. So they have to try to suppress. They have to try to overturn votes. They have to try to prevent the debate from taking place in the first place. And that's a losing proposition as well. Because every time the Israel lobby censors or tries to censor the discourse, especially on college campuses. And I would encourage you to read Ali Abu Nama's new book, uh, The Battle for Justice in Palestine, where he documents in quite a lot of detail these uh, repression tactics on campus. The more the Israel lobby does that, the more they lose too, because students all over the country are becoming angry at the fact that Palestine is the one issue that cannot be talked about freely in many uh, instances, and they don't understand why uh, that is the case. So engaging in censorship, which is what the Israel lobby has been reduced to when it tries to confront these initiatives, 
is a losing proposition because what is more un-American than trying to censor freedom of expression? Um, so continue with these BDS campaigns. That would, that would be my uh, advice. So yeah, we have a special relationship, but we're also broke. <laughs> we're broke, we're uh, $16 trillion in debt. And I, I shouldn't say that we're broke. I mean, we spend all of our money on uh, the military. We just had tax day two days ago on April 15th. 57% of all discretionary funding, meaning, okay, so there's two parts of the budget, right? There's discretionary and there's non-discretionary. Discretionary is what we choose to spend our money on. The non-discretionary part is, well, maybe not you all as students yet, but what we as adults pay into this system, which is our money, which we get back when we, re when we retire. It's not the government's money, it's ours, they're just holding it for us. So of the discretionary budget, we spend 57 cents of every dollar on the military. So we're not broke, we're spending it all on the military, but the fact that we're engaging in all these uh, wars of empire is bankrupting us, for sure. Uh, so we don't have the money. We really don't have the money uh, to bail Israel out. Uh, so I don't think that's feasible. And I think it's very, very possible, as President Obama recognized, that the United States will be powerless to prevent the international community from acting. And I think what he was referencing was the fact that if these negotiations break down, then the Palestinians are likely to join the International Criminal Court. There's no veto at the International Criminal Court. If Palestine becomes a member of the ICC, Israeli military and political leaders can be held accountable for their actions in international criminal courts. And the US can do nothing to stop it. So it could very well uh, become a situation where the U.S. obstinacy uh, on this issue becomes irrelevant. I don't know. It might, but we also might see shifts in the political system here in the United States because let's not forget, South Africa has special relationship with the United States during the apartheid years. We provide the South African regime with lots of weapons, define the international embargo for at least a dozen years before the United States passed sanctions. And the reality is, despite the United States supporting the apartheid regime of South Africa in many ways, today you won't find a politician who will admit to the fact that the United States supported apartheid. Of course, apartheid in South Africa was always wrong. Of course, we always opposed it. That's not at all the historical record. So it could very well be that politicians just get tired of Israel and it becomes so isolated and such a drag on other U.S. interests that it simply is uh, thrown under the bus, as, as Mitt Romney uh, would say. All right, let's take another round. So let's do one, two, and three. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, good question. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, um, I guess you touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what you feel the role of like public opinion in America will play. Yeah. And uh, if you see like if you've seen like any uh, big shift and change in there. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, please. Uh, so you mentioned early on that um, the early optimism you had for Obama was lost when he capitulated early on in his first term towards who gives the lobby. You said that some U.S. presidents have capitulated and some U.S. presidents have stood up, but I was wondering what you meant, what were some of the examples of U.S. presidents standing up to these really lobby demands? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, well, first of all, I don't believe that there is going to be a two-state resolution. I think Israel has made it crystal clear that it prefers the ongoing colonization of Palestinian land over any true Palestinian sovereignty over any portion of this land. But uh, let's, play out, let's play out your scenario and say that there is uh, a state. Uh, no, under the negotiations that are currently taking place, Israel would uh, have the right of what's called hot pursuit. 
into the state of Palestine, where the Israeli military could go in anytime they want and chase down and arrest and injure and kill anyone they call a terrorist. So, uh, I mean, Israel has never had respect for borders. I mean, Israel doesn't have borders. There are no international borders with Israel. There are armistice lines, which are temporary. But Israel has never declared borders. Uh, and it's always wanted to expand to as much of historic Palestine as possible. Uh, so no, I don't think a uh, nominal Palestinian non-sovereign entity would, would change that uh, dynamic. Uh, public opinion, this is I think one of the bright spots. And even though it's not necessarily reflected in public opinion polling, I think you're seeing more and more examples of this change uh, occurring. So one example I write about in the book happened at the Democratic National uh, Committee meetings in 2012 when the platform committee forgot <laughs> to put in its standard usual uh, plank of declaring Jerusalem to be the eternal united undivided capital of the state of Israel. So they had to do it from the floor and ask for a voice vote by acclamation. And the guy who was presiding over the uh, committee meeting was Antonio Villaregosa, the mayor of Los Angeles. And so he calls for a vote on this question. There's this deafening roar of opposition from the entirety of the DNC sitting there on the convention floor. And it's clear that they don't have anywhere near the two-thirds support necessary uh, to pass this resolution. So he looks kind of stunned. You can watch, you can watch there's a, a YouTube video of it that's still up. Uh, he looks stunned, he doesn't know what to do. And so, you know, this, this handler comes out and like whispers in his ear and you can hear him because he's like whispering right into the mic. He's like, call the vote again. So Villaregosa calls the vote again. And this time there's even more deafening outroar uh, and outrage over the fact that not only would they do this uh, stupid foreign policy plank that the party doesn't support, but that they would violate democratic procedures to revote it. So now Villaregosa is really shocked and really doesn't know what to do because it's clearly been rejected again by the floor of the DNC. So the handler comes out again and tells him to call another vote. So he calls a third vote and of course there's an even more deafening roar against this uh, resolution. And so Villaregosa just looks around and is like, uh, I declare that the yeas have it in this totally undemocratic uh, procedure. And uh, one of the people I work with, his brother is an is a <coughs> audio uh, specialist. So he, he ran the audio of it and he found that instead of two thirds supporting this resolution, about two thirds were opposed to it just by the decibel level. So it's clear from these kind of anecdotes that things are definitely changing uh, at the grassroots level. There's more and better uh, media coverage, especially on the op-ed pages. There's an uh, unprecedented amount of Palestinian voices that are getting into the mainstream press, and I think that's having an impact uh, on discourse. And just recently, there was a very interesting public opinion poll uh, done through the University of Maryland, which asked the question, if, uh, if, if these talks break down, uh, do you support uh, Israel maintaining this current discriminatory regime over the Palestinians, or do you support there being uh, one state where Palestinians and Israeli Jews live as equals? The results, two to one, Americans supported notions of democracy and equality, because this is how we see ourselves. We certainly don't always live up to it, uh, but that's how we see ourselves and our values uh, in the world. So Israel knows this quite well, which is the only reason why it wants the uh, extension of these talks uh, you know, uh, ad infinitum, uh, for eternity. Uh, one thing I, I should say about the title of my book is that it was, it was not my hopes that were shattered, uh, but it was the president's hopes for resolving this issue that were shattered. I actually wasn't all that optimistic, despite uh, encouraging rhetoric that was heard uh, from the president. And I think that he approached this issue very naively. I thought that he entered the White House and believed that if you made a good speech about an uh, issue, that this would change the policy. And this is not, not how Washington works. Washington works by lobby groups uh, constraining 
the parameters of debate and policy choices and options and the president was woefully uh, unprepared and unwilling to push back against this pressure. Uh, and yeah, there have been other presidents who have pushed back. So for example, and now to be fair to Obama, the Israel lobby of today is much, much stronger than it was in the time of Eisenhower, but he was the quintessential president who pushed back against the power of the Israel lobby. And when Israel invaded and occupied the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula in 1956, this was like right before Eisenhower's re-election in the midst of a presidential campaign. And Eisenhower went to a rally, I think it was in Philadelphia, two or three days before the election. There was an in-person crowd, uh, in crowd of 15,000 people, and it was nationally televised. And he stood up and he talked about Israel's uh, invasion and occupation of Egypt and said that there has to be one law for the strong and one law for the weak, not two different laws. And that Israel had to comply with international law and withdraw from Egyptian territory. He said that in the heat of a presidential election. And even before saying that, he had cut off all economic and military aid to Israel. And what he told Israel after the election was that if you don't remove your troops from Egypt right now, I will also make sure that all private donations from the United States to Israel are stopped. Do you know how long it took Israel to make the decision to withdraw after that? Two days. So that's the power that the United States has when we actually choose to use it. Uh, LBJ famously said, what's the point of having political capital if you're not willing to spend it? And as I argue uh, in the book, unfortunately, President Obama was not willing to spend any of the tremendous political capital that he had at the outset of his, his, of his administration to push back uh, against this pressure. Uh, do we have time for another round? Let me see if there are uh, new people who haven't had a chance yet. So let's do one. And let me see if uh, I, I got you for one already, right? Let me see if there are new hands. Okay, two. Anyone else who didn't get a chance? Okay, and three. All right. Yes. Okay. Um, do you think that it, it is possible to have just peace between Israel and Palestine prior to U.S. withdrawal of essentially our, our underwriting policy towards every, you know, every move that Israel makes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, good question. Okay, um, yeah, please. Uh, whenever people talk about two state or one state solution during the peace process, uh, it seems that Hamas and Hamas are and all that kind of gets left out. Yeah. How do you see Hamas? Um, do you see Hamas's role in these negotiations for uh, increasing over the coming years, or do you think Hamas uh, will like win the influence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, please. Okay. So, do you think a pro-Palestinian representative, when he runs, do you think he'll succeed, or will um, the, the Israel lobby stop? Him? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good, good questions. Okay, so before I answer these uh, last few ones, let me remind you, if you filled out a postcard to President Obama, please leave it uh, on the table on your way out. Uh, and I have books available for purchase, and I'm very glad to sign them for you. Uh, if you'd like, they're $25 for community members, $20 special student rate, uh, and anyone who's limited income. Uh, and we can do cash, check, or charge, whatever you prefer. Um, okay, so the, the last questions. Uh, can there be a just and lasting peace between Palestinians and Israelis before these U.S. policies underwriting Israel's oppression end? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I think it is possible. Uh, I think that Israel could get so delegitimized and so turned into a pariah on the international scene and lose so much money uh, from BDS campaigns that the policies of the United States become irrelevant. Because, you know, look what happened in South Africa. This is why I believe that a price has to be imposed on Israel to change these policies. When the South African economy 
uh, started to face losses. This was when the business community in apartheid South Africa started pressuring the political leaders to get rid of this apartheid system uh, because business is business, right? Uh, and so we're seeing uh, similar trends developing right now uh, in the Israeli business class. Uh, so you could, you could theoretically, I think, uh, have a transition before uh, U.S. policies are, are changed. Um, but obviously, the more support the United States provides to Israel's apartheid policies, the longer this process gets dragged out, which is, of course, not in Israel's best interest and certainly not in the best interest of Israeli Jews because the longer you have the oppression go on, the harder it will be to reconcile. Uh, nevertheless, I do think that reconciliation uh, is possible once the, once the oppression is ended. Uh, yeah, great question about Hamas uh, and its role uh, in this so-called peace process. As I document uh, in the book, in George Mitchell, his strategy, one of his principles, which were known as the Mitchell Principles in Northern Ireland, was that all of the parties that have a stake in the issue have to be at the negotiating table. I mean, this is like common sense conflict resolution, because if you exclude parties to the deal, they're not going to sign on to it. They will not own it. Uh, after Hamas came to power in the Gaza Strip, and by the way, there was a US CIA-backed uh, coup attempt in Gaza to drive out Hamas, which is documented in Vanity Fair by Adam Rose, which is a very important read. Um, in the aftermath of Hamas gaining power following the 2006 legislative elections, the Hamas leadership was very clear. They said, we are ready for a long-term peace with Israel and we're ready for a two-state resolution. And I mean, this is not like secret knowledge. I mean, uh, Khaled Mish'al and other Hamas leaders were writing this in the San Francisco Chronicle for everyone to read. So the, the record is quite clear that Hamas put out these feelers. And as I document in the book, they actually put out feelers to the Obama administration too in 2009 because they wanted to be part of this process. But the Obama administration shut them out. So the Obama administration and the Bush administration said that Hamas can only come to the table if it renounces violence, if it agrees to recognize Israel, and if it agrees to fulfill all of the previous signed agreements. Well, are there reciprocal demands made on Israel to sit at the negotiating table? Of course not. Israel has never recognized Palestinian national or human rights. Israel has been in continuous violation of its obligations to stop freezing settlements, which were uh, imposed as a condition of this peace process no less than four times over the course of 20 years. So, you know, it goes to the uh, hypocrisy of our policy because we allow Israel to do all of these things and actually collude with it. But, you know, in Hamas's case, we say that it has to fulfill X, Y, Z before they can even uh, sit at the table, which is a, a losing proposition uh, in terms of conflict resolution. And John Kerry has been quite explicit. He said, whatever deal emerges through this framework agreement only applies to the West Bank, we'll deal with Gaza later. So Kerry's vision is to turn the West <laughs> Bank into a second version of Gaza and call it a state and then deal with Gaza uh, sometime, sometime later. Uh, there are members of Congress who are more or less uh, friendly to Palestinian human rights. Uh, some of them are more or less uh, explicit uh, in that support, but it is possible. The sky doesn't fall. Uh, the world doesn't end when a politician opposes uh, an Israeli policy, although sometimes the Israel lobby does, are, uh, does mobilize uh, to pick off a wounded politician. But in many cases, a politician like John Conyers in Michigan, like John Dingell in Michigan, can express support for Palestinian rights for decades and decades and decades and still continue to serve. So it's not impossible. And I don't want to overinflate the power of the Israel lobby because the Israel lobby doesn't always win. And in fact, recently has been losing quite a lot lost Iran, lost Syria, lost the campaign to get Israel into the visa waiver program, which would allow Israelis 
to enter the United States without a visa. The State Department came out and said, no, Israel doesn't qualify for this program because it discriminates against Palestinian and Arab and Muslim Americans. And we can't let them into the program uh, because of that. So it's definitely not all powerful. It definitely doesn't control the policy. It just has a huge uh, influence over it. Uh, so with that, I want to thank the uh, International House uh, and SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, for organizing this event. Uh, thank you all for coming out. And please check out a copy of the book. Thank you very much. Thank you.